two. Less than a week after our return to England, strange things began to happen. We lived as recluses, devoid of friends, alone, and without servants in a few rooms of the ancient manor house on a bleak and unfrequented moor. So that our doors were seldom disturbed by the knock of the visitor. Now, however, we were troubled by what seemed to be frequent fumblings in the night, not only around the doors, but around the windows, also upper as well as lower. Once we fancied that a large opaque body darkened the library window where the moon was shining against it, and another time we thought we heard a whirring and flapping sound not far off. On each occasion, investigation revealed nothing, and we began to ascribe the occurrences to imagination alone. That same curiously disturbed imagination which pro still prolonged in our ears, the faint far bang we thought we heard, and the Holland churchyard. The jade amulet now reposed in a niche in our museum, and sometimes we burned strangely scented candles before it. We've read much of Alhazaret's Necronomicon about its properties, and about the relations of ghouls' souls to objects it symbolized, and were disturbed by what we read. Then terror came. On the night of September 24th, I heard a knock at my chamber door. Fancying it St. John's, I bade the knocker enter, but was answered only by a shrill laugh. There was no one in the corridor. When I aroused St. John from his sleep, he professed entire ignorance of the event and became as worried as I. It was that night that the faint distant bang over the moor came to us as a certain and dreaded reality. Four days later, we, well, whilst we were both in the hidden museum, there came a low, cautious scratching at the single door which led to the secret library staircase. Our alarm was now divided, for besides our fear of the unknown, we had always entertained the dread of that our grisly collection might be discovered. Extinguishing all lights, we proceeded to the door and threw it open, suddenly open, whereupon we felt an unaccountable rush of air and heard as if receding far away a queer combination of rustling, tittering, and articulate chatter. Whether we were mad, dreaming, or in our, in our senses, we did not try to determine. We only realized with the blackest of apprehensions that the apparently disembodied chatter was beyond a doubt in the Dutch language. After that, we lived in growing horror and fascination. Mostly we held to the theory that we were joining, jointly going mad from our life of unnatural excitements. But sometimes it pleased us more to dr dramatize ourselves as the victims of some creeping and appalling doom. Bizarre manifestations were now too frequent to count. Our lonely house was seemingly alive with the presence of some malign being whose nature we could not guess. And every night, that demonic bang rolled over the windswept moor, always louder and louder. On October 29th, we found in the soft earth under the library window a series of footprints utterly impossible to describe. 
They were as baffling as the horde of brick bats which haunted the old manor house in unprecedented increase in numbers. The horror reached a culmination on November 18th, when St. John, walking home after dark from the distant railway station, was seized by some frightful carnivorous thing and torn to ribbons. His screams were reached the house, and I had hastened to the terrible scene in time to hear a whir of wings and see a vague, black, cloudy thing silhouetted against the rising moon. My friend was dying when I spoke to him, and he could not answer coherently. All I could do was to whisper, The amulet, that damn thing. And he collapsed, an inert mass of mangled flesh. I buried him in the next midnight in one of our neglected gardens and mumbled over his body one of the devilish rituals he had left in life. And as I pronounced the last demonic sentence, I heard afar on the moor the faint baying of some gigantic hound. The moon was up, but I dared not look at it. And what I saw in the dim lid and more of a wide nebula shadow sweeping from mound to mound, I shut my eyes and threw my face down upon the ground. When I rose trembling, I knew not how much later. I staggered into the house and made shocking obeisances before the enshrined amulet of green jade. Being now afraid to live alone in the ancient house in the moor, I departed on the following day for London, taking with me the amulet after destroying by fire and burial with the rest of the impious collection of the museum. But after three nights, I heard the bang again. And before a week was over, I felt strange eyes upon me whenever it was dark. One evening, I, as I strolled on the Victoria embank Embankment, for some needed air. I saw a black sh shape obscure one of the reflections of the lamps in the water. A wind stronger than the wind night the night wind rushed by me, and I knew that what had befallen St. John must soon befall me. The next night I carefully wrapped the green jade amulet and sailed for Holland. What mercy I might gain by returning the thing to its silent sleeping owner, I knew not. But I thought that I must at least try to any step of conceivably logical. What the hound was, and why it pursued me, were questions still vague. But I first heard the bang in that ancient churchyard, and every sub subsequent event, including St. John's dying whisper, had served to connect the curse with the stealing of the amulet. Accordingly, I sank into the nevertheless most abysses of despair when in, at an inn in Rotterdam. I discovered that thieves had despoiled me of the sole means of salvation. The bang was loud that evening, and in the morning I read of the nameless deed in the vilest quarters of the city. The rabble was in terror. For upon an evil te tenement had, bef had fallen a red death beyond the foulest previous crime in the neighborhood. In a squall of thieves' den, an entire family had been torn to shreds by an unknown thing which left no trace. And those around had heard all night about the, us the usual clamor of drunken voices, a faint, deep, insistent note as if a, of a gigantic hound. So at last I stood again in that unwholesome churchyard where a pale winter moon cast hideous shadows and leafless trees drooped solemnly to meet the withered frosty grass and cracking slabs, and the ivy church pointed a jeering finger at the unfriendly sky, and the night wind howled maniacally from over frozen swamps and frigid seas. The bang was very faint now, and it ceased altogether as I approached the ancient grave I had once violated. 
and frightened away an abnormally large horde of bats which had been hovering curiously around it. I know not whether why I went thither unless to pray, or gibber out insane pleas and apologies to the calm white thing that lay within. But whatever my reason, I attacked the half frozen side with a desperation partly mine and partly that of a dominating will outside myself. Excavation was much easier than I expected, though at one point I encountered a, f a queer interruption when a lean vulture darted down out of the cold sky and pecked frantically at the grave earth until I killed it with a blow of my spade. Finally, I reached the rotting oblong box and removed the damp nitrous cover. This is the last rational act I ever performed. For crouched within that century coffin, embraced by a close-packed nightmare retinue of a huge suony sleeping bats, was the bony thing my friend and I had robbed. Not clean and flaccid as we had seen it then, but covered with caked blood and and shreds of alien flesh and hair, and leering sentiently at me with phosphorescent sockets and sharp and sanguine fangs, yawning twistedly in mockery of my inevitable doom. And when it gave from those grinning jaws a deep sardonic bay, as of some gigantic hound, and I saw that it held within its gory, filthy claw the lost and fateful amulet of green jade. I merely screamed and ran away idiotically. My screams soon dissolved into peals of hysterical laughter. Madness rides the star wind. Claws and teeth sharpened on centuries of corpses Dripping death astride a bacchanal of bats from night black ruins of buried temples at, of Belial. Now, as the bang of that dead fleshless monstrosity grows louder and louder, and the stealthy whirring of flapping of those accursed web wings circles closer and closer. Ah, so I shall seek with my revolver the oblivion which is my only refuge from the unnamed and unnamed abode.